This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Coming up on the next Carolina Impact. More train service using less fuel. We've got your first look at North Carolina's plans for cleaner, greener hybrid trains between Charlotte and Raleigh. Plus, find out how a test involving sophisticated equipment like this keeps natural gas flowing through the region. And we take a look at the growth and impact of a local health care organization celebrating its 75th anniversary. Don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. WTBI PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by... The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Cars make the trip faster and cheaper. The airlines fly frequently. So if you're going from Charlotte to Raleigh, why would you take the train? North Carolina's in-state twice a day rail service, known as the Piedmont, is adding a third round trip soon. And it's spending hundreds of millions of your federal tax dollars on track improvements. But the real improvement may be the new hybrid locomotives that will be pulling those trains. It's a story you'll see only on Carolina Impact. Reporter Jeff Saunier is at the Charlotte Amtrak station on North Tryon Street with more. Well, Amy, the North Carolina Rail Division has a history of making and breaking its promises regarding rail service here in North Carolina. They've underestimated project costs, they've overestimated project job numbers, and they've built multi-million dollar projects that were supposed to save travel time that didn't save much time at all. Well, now, WTVI has learned of a new rail plan that may actually do what it's supposed to do, providing more North Carolina rail service while using less rail fuel. Look like you're on your way to Raleigh? Yes, sir. Chances are you've never actually bought a ticket. Okay, that's $206. How would you like to pay for that? Once again, this will be our first sporting announcement. Or boarded the train from Charlotte to Raleigh before. Take us out, ladies and gentlemen. Going to carry. train the Piedmont, 74 making the following station stops, Kannapolis, Salisbury. Maybe you'd ride if the train was more convenient, or less expensive, or both. And we'll be Raleigh. Yes, wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> I think we'd have uh, a lot of roommates sitting next to us instead of the empty seats that we are have now. Or maybe if train travel just didn't seem like something out of some old movie. Here is modern rail transportation at its best. A new world of rest and relaxation. A time for forgetting cares in finest luxury and easy comfort. Blue railroad train going down the railroad track. I think a lot of that is just public perception, but based on history, it's certainly accurate that locomotives in the olden days were rolling smokestacks. Lynn Harris is a rail consultant for the North Carolina DOT, and he says the next big thing for the trains from Charlotte to Raleigh won't necessarily make them any faster or any fancier. But it will make them leaner and cleaner and greener. We're talking about hybrid trains on the tracks in the next two or three years. Yes, sir, absolutely. Within the not too distant future, we can certainly expect that NCDOT's entire fleet is gonna go in this direction. What we can do is hopefully serve as a prototype for other railroads to follow, is that they can see that this is viable technology, it is cost effective, and it does actually work. Harris and fellow NCDOT consultant David Cook unveiled the tales of North Carolina's hybrid train plan at this conference in Mooresville. Their diagram showing publicly for the first time the state's new on-order locomotives with hybrid natural gas engines on board. The new engines promising big decreases in pollution 
and big savings on fuel, even along North Carolina's slow stop-and-go Charlotte to Raleigh line. They don't run straight lines through North Carolina. They run through a lot of curves, a lot of small cities, up and down hills. There's a lot of reasons to slow the train down. So that's a significant part of the pretty substantial energy savings, which in this simulation, so they end up with 28%, which is, you know, not 50%, but it's, that's pretty significant. The state of North Carolina has realized that our trains and the configuration of our rail system fits very nicely with these fuels in terms of implementation. So we're looking to embrace those. DOT is hoping train passengers embrace hybrids too. My school is all about green and going green and I think if they knew it was green, more people would take the train. Meanwhile, on campus at UNC Charlotte, look what else we managed to track down. It's a test track for what researchers say is the nation's first train powered by hydrogen, an actual working model of what could be the passenger train engine of tomorrow. It's pretty far ahead. Uh, at the moment, the industry just can't bring down the cost of the fuel cells enough, so we're laying the groundwork for 10 years of the future. Everything on this train from suspension to traction is exactly what you'd see on a full-scale train, just smaller. We've had good feedback from people in the rail industry that we talk to um, and tell them what, what we're trying to do and what we're planning on working on, and so they're interested. We're hoping this is something that we can grow. Others close to the UNC Charlotte Rail Research say the hydrogen locomotives they're working on now could potentially power Charlotte's future Lynx line to Mooresville, along with the Charlotte to Raleigh rail surface. To really test, evaluate, uh, improve designs, and making sure the technology is, is ready when we want to install it. And that train technology is overdue, say current rail riders, long overdue. Without a doubt, there's a lesson. Change is positive and green is good. <laughs> and once again, North Carolina rail planners tell us that these changes involving the hybrid locomotives won't require any significant additional spending, which means they'll be saving significant dollars on rail fuel without costing taxpayers anything extra. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. According to North Carolina's new 25-year comprehensive state rail plan, over the past 12 years, rail ridership in the state has increased 93%, with most of those new passengers on the Charlotte to Raleigh trains. The rail plan also calls for a new Charlotte Amtrak station in Uptown sometime after the year 2020. Construction of Raleigh's new Amtrak station started back in May. Well, as fall ushers in cooler temps, many of us will be raising our thermostats or lighting our gas logs to stay comfy. From hot water heaters to clothes dryers, natural gas fuels a number of appliances we rely on each and every day. But have you ever thought about what it takes to ensure the natural gas you depend on is available when you need it? As Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark discovered, a smart pig plays a big role in keeping our natural gas flowing. Flames, frying pans, and food orders. Put that escargot back in the window. During the lunch hour, the kitchen staff at George's Brasserie stays busy. Executive chef Jeff Schreiber prepares about 100 meals daily. That means he has to work quickly. When we're using gas, it doesn't take as long. We can get a nice high temperature from the gas here. Schreiber has an order for scallops. He turns up the heat on his gas stove. In seconds, the flames are hot and he places three thick sea scallops in a frying pan. It won't take long for them to cook. There really are a lot of different steps that go into making sure that your gas service is reliable, that it's safe, and that it's there when you need it the most. There are about 2.4 million miles of natural gas pipeline in the U.S. Most pipelines originate from the Gulf of Mexico and go up the East Coast. So we're tapping into those lines to get the gas off of that and then we re-deliver it or redistribute it to our customers here in the Carolinas and over in Middle Tennessee. Piedmont Natural Gas maintains 25,000 miles of natural gas pipeline. That's basically the circumference of the earth. During the spring and summer months, when demand is typically lower, the company conducts tests looking for potential problems with the pipelines. We caught up with these workers in Gaston County. We're looking for any kind of differences in the wall thickness of the pipe that might have been caused by uh, somebody digging into our pipeline or, or damaging it or just normal issues with the pipe. This large piece of equipment is called an inline inspection device, but workers call it a smart pig 
and they refer to this test as pigging the line. The smart pig has sensors capable of gathering information from inside the pipe while gas is flowing. Once the pig enters the pipe and the hatch is closed, workers inject more gas. It all has to do with having enough gas and pressures in the pipeline to push that pig through the pipeline. This test will focus on a 21-mile segment of the pipeline. It will take about four hours for the smart pig to travel that far. Piedmont Natural Gas is headquartered in this building located less than a mile from South Park Mall. The company employs nearly 2,000 people in three states. About 900 work in Charlotte. Victor Gaglio gives us a rare look inside the gas dispatching and control center. What's the power load today? Large electronic screens can show every city where the company has pipelines. Each color and line represents pressures and flow of natural gas in the system. Employees work in this room around the clock every day of the year. They'll get alarms if things go out of our parameters and make adjustments on the system to again ensure safety and reliability. The gas dispatching and control center functions as the company's nerve center. All one million of our customers are monitored through, uh, through this facility here. Piedmont Natural Gas and three other companies including Dominion, Duke Energy and AGL Resources are hoping to build a 550 mile natural gas pipeline from West Virginia to Robson County, North Carolina. In September, the group filed a permit with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, seeking approval for the $5 billion project. But not everyone is in support of the pipeline. A number of groups have concerns about the impact the pipeline could have on water resources and geology, threatened species, public safety, and other environmental impacts. Whenever you do a, a project of this magnitude, there's varying opinions out there. So yes, you do see resistance, but part of the whole outreach concept is to listen to, listen to uh, stakeholders' concerns and incorporate them into your project to minimize uh, uh, those concerns. FERC's decision about the pipeline should be announced by the summer of 2016. In West Charlotte, a flare pipe burns off excess natural gas where today's 21-mile test will end. Eager workers press their ear against the large pipe, listening intently as the smart pig approaches. When it arrives, workers unlatch the pipe and carefully remove it. Engineers will analyze the data recorded during the test. We get all the data from it and we can tell if there's any issue we need to work on really all about safety and reliable service to our customers. Back at George's Brasserie, Chef Schreiber scoops a little oil in his pan-seared scallops. They turned a beautiful golden brown color. He grabs a plate and turns up the heat to saute a few greens. While Chef Schreiber's job can be difficult, he says cooking with natural gas makes it a little bit easier. And he's always pleased with the final result. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Reibenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. Joining me now is Tom Skeins, the chairman, president, and chief executive officer of Piedmont Natural Gas. Tom, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Amy. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Okay, so I'm going to brag on you just for a minute. Okay. Brand new information right off the, off the press, as I understand. J.D. Power's ranking has just made Piedmont Natural Gas number eight in gas utilities customer service satisfaction. And there's over 80 different folks out there that you're up against, almost 100 folks. 83 to be specific, and uh, this, these results we're gratified to, to hear. Uh, we are publicizing them, as you just mentioned, but it's due to a lot of hard work by our teammates across the company. Good customer service and focusing on, on excellence in customer service delivery and a great customer experience is ingrained within our corporate culture, and I couldn't be more proud of our teammates uh, across the Piedmont Natural Gas Service area. Well, let's talk about that corporate culture. You like to call it a healthy, high-performance culture. How do you make that happen? I do. Uh, healthy, high-performance is our mantra uh, as a part of our Piedmont Pride uh, corporate culture uh, training initiative at, at our company. And we talk often about getting the right, the right results the right way. And that's important for us. It's not just the business results you get and achieve, it's how you achieve them that's equally as important. Uh, for me, uh, I, I, I practice a leadership style that is open and collaborative, uh, that, that focuses on team rather than self, uh, that focuses on 
uh, all of us as leaders being a little mini self-improvement projects. Uh, all of us are striving for excellence, trying to, to grow as executives and as leaders and as employees in a company. And you can't do that alone. It, take, it takes feedback, it takes coaching, both giving and receiving. It takes a learning mindset, what we call a growth mindset. Uh, so we promote cross-functional training in the organization. So all of our employees have the opportunity to see the business from an enterprise thinking standpoint rather than just their functional uh, area. And, and it comes down to this corporate culture we're trying to build, to, to having it sustainable through ongoing training uh, and, and again, feedback and, and coaching uh, where we do get the right results the right way. So uh, I hope you have a chance to visit uh, our, our resource centers, our, our company. Just talk to the employees about how they feel about our company and our customers and our community because it, it's part of our mission, core values, and importantly, our, our corporate culture. And how do you grow individual people? Because that's kind of one of the most exciting things that you will often hear in surveys by employees. It's not always about how much money they make. It's about that feeling of, of growth and that feeling of personal satisfaction on the job. How do you keep that going? You know, it's, it's empowering uh, our teammates uh, to, to make decisions. Uh, we, you know, we use the word accountability. Some people see that as a negative. It's a very much a positive in our culture. Our employees want to be empowered. They want to be accountable. Uh, for bringing uh, about great results in our business. They want to be empowered to deliver wonderful customer service. They want to be in, empowered uh, to, to making the, the right business decision, to focusing on the right investment opportunities. I think it's tapping into the leadership potential in each and every employee, regardless of their position at the company. Uh, we have ongoing uh, corporate culture training programs. We have uh, cross-training functional uh, uh, responsibilities uh, across the, uh, the company to broaden the, the career opportunities for employees. Uh, we have a variety of different uh, supervisory and management skills trainings programs that we institute. So it, it's, it's a constant focus of our company. You know, I've heard the phrase, and you probably have too, culture eats vision for breakfast. If you don't have that culture, no leader's vision can help you get to where you're striving to be as a company. But you've really invested that time and the energy into that culture. And by seeing, you're seeing the results and you're reaping the rewards of that now. How do we help others kind of get started that might be working on transitioning a company from good to great? Well, you have to be intentional. And it doesn't happen by itself. Uh, you can't establish a vision statement, a mission statement, and a set of core values and put it on the shelf. You have to breathe life into it. And, and we've done that through what we call our Piedmont Pride Leadership Training uh, workshops and living our corporate culture. So it's, it, you have to ingrain it into your performance management systems. So again, we look at not only the business results we achieve each year, but each and every employee is evaluated from a leadership competency standpoint and how we're living our core values as a company. Uh, all of our business plans relate to our vision, mission, and values. We're very intentional and strategic about that. And, and we, we basically coach each other, have coaching relationships at the company, uh, both giving and receiving, uh, and I welcome that as well. Because you, you cannot improve if you don't change. And you can't change unless you have feedback on what you're doing well and what you could do to be more effective. And that's at all levels of the organization. And coming with this, I think the leadership of a corporation who really wants to get this right uh, has to have some humility, too, in the process and, and recognition that no one's perfect. We all can improve. Again, we're all learning and growing. And, uh, and, and this promotes, I think, a culture where, where employees open up to the management team and vice versa and allow us to, to trade ideas on how we can improve and be better. I wish we had more time, but they say the only constant in life is change. So thank you for sharing change, and thank you for sharing some of your leadership style with us. Thank you, Amy. Next up, it's something we don't like to think about, but we're very lucky in this region to have a variety of wonderful healthcare options when we need them. One of those organizations, Carolina's Healthcare System, celebrates a milestone this year, 75 years of service. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser shares how what started as a small community hospital transformed into one of the nation's largest public health care systems and introduces us to some patients whose lives have been improved because of it. Yeah, yeah. 
Ian Asher's parents credit the team at Levine Children's Hospital for saving his life. At six months old, doctors diagnosed him with a congenital heart defect called total anomalous pulmonary venous return, meaning the veins responsible for taking blood from his lungs to his heart didn't attach normally to the left side of his heart. My first reaction was like, right away I asked Chuck, is he gonna survive? The team here specializes in neonatal surgery with infant mortality rates three times better than the national average. We're able to offer hope. We have great results to show families and I think that's reassuring to families. To them, it was a very simple procedure. So they made us feel very comfortable with, with, uh, with the fact that Ian was going to have heart surgery, open heart surgery. As Dr. Peeler put it, done. Right Today, here. Ian is an energetic, healthy three-year-old. Making his way down the slide ah, boom, hold and slam dunking the basketball. Levine Children's Hospital, a 198-bed facility, is one of Carolina's healthcare system's nearly 40 hospitals. The organization traces its roots to October 7, 1940, when Charlotte Memorial Hospital opened. It was a uh, public hospital, and uh, its mission was to admit anyone, regardless of ability to pay. Retired Charlotte Observer editor Jerry Shin details the history of the organization in his book, A Great Public Compassion, the story of Charlotte Memorial Hospital and Carolina's Medical Center. Shortly after it opened, a group of doctors and nurses from Charlotte Memorial formed a medical unit to support frontline aid stations during World War II. Dr. Paul Sanger, a thoracic surgeon, led the effort to organize what became known as the 38th Evacuation Hospital, operating in London, North Africa, and Italy from 1942 to 1945. When Paul Sanger came back, he said, you know, we were doing surgery, saving lives in a tent somewhere. And if we come back here and we have a nice hospital and nice operating rooms and good equipment, it sort of opened his eyes to the possibilities. We don't have to accept just what we're doing now. We can do more. Another pioneer of surgery, Dr. Francis Robicek moved to Charlotte from Hungary in 1956. He had a hand in building the area's first heart-lung machine. The device pumps oxygen-rich blood through a patient's body during open-heart surgery, allowing surgeons to save more lives. Charlotte Memorial Hospital had a vision to attract the difficult and complicated matters. We always got the difficult cases, the complex cases, the serious injuries, Charlotte Memorial also had a reputation as a second-rate hospital, caring for the community's poor. Shin says that reputation began to fade when Harry Nurkin took over as CEO in 1981. Man, I think his first year here, uh, he went to the board with a plan that just everybody's jaw dropped. He said, this is what we're going to do next year and next and so forth. And everybody said, we can't do that, but they did. The hospital changed its name to Carolina's Medical Center in 1990. The Charlotte Mecklenburg Hospital Authority, responsible for daily operations of the hospital, rebranded itself in 1996, becoming Carolina's healthcare system. Nurkin retired in 2002, passing the torch to Michael Tarwater. I'm very proud to say that, that, that Charlotte is now a destination. Carolina's healthcare system provides services that are world class. The organization opened Levine Children's Hospital in 2007, followed by Levine Cancer Institute in 2010. With more than two dozen locations across the Carolinas, the center treats about 15,000 new patients each year. They described a, an elegant vision of wanting to develop a, a really large regional cancer center and really offering great care to patients in this area. Patients like Edwina Edgeworth, Diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, there is a time she could barely walk from her car into the doctor's office. Now, three years later, she says she's alive and thriving after enrolling in a clinical trial. They were confident in what they were doing and what they were saying, and you know, you just made you feel comfortable knowing that they had it all under control. From its start as a 300-bed hospital to an organization with more than 900 care locations across North and South Carolina, Tarwater says employees work with one mission in mind. To take care of basically all God's children, uh, to take care of those people who need care 
regardless of their ability to pay. Built on a foundation of care and compassion, Tarwater says the organization's leaders haven't lost sight of its original mission, to offer hope and healing to thousands of patients like Ian and Edwina. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. You can watch more stories of hope and healing right here on WTVI PBS Charlotte next Tuesday at 8.30 in our new documentary, A Legacy of Caring, 75 Years of Carolina's Healthcare System. Well, it's trivia time now. Have you ever heard of the term luthier? Well, that's someone who makes or repairs string instruments. About five years ago, Kevin Marshall lost his job as a toolmaker machinist at a NASCAR garage in our area, so he followed his passion to open a string instrument shop in Charlotte. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis shares his story. This is the first guitar I built. I had no clue as to what I was doing. If you didn't know he was here, you wouldn't know he was here. So I built this thing in 99. You won't see his name or business listed anywhere out front. But that's just the way Kevin Marshall likes it. So as you can see, I do a variety of work. I work on mandolins. Uh, this is a cool vintage mandolin. This is a custom built mandolin. Uh, I really like the oddball guitars. This is a Harmony Stratotone. It's a 58 or 59 model that I restored. Tucked into an office park in East Charlotte, Kevin rents space from the Metrolina Dental Lab, where they make bridges and other parts for dentists all around Charlotte. Over in his space, Kevin is making bridges as well, except these aren't the ones that go in your mouth. They're the ones that go on guitars. Kevin owns and operates Smiling Moon Guitars. As a luthier, he provides everything from basic setups and restringing all the way to custom builds and major restorations. If it has strings on it, he'll work on it. I've been playing guitar since I was, you know, 14 years old, and I would take it to have it repaired, and the repair work was uh, less than desirable. You know, it just wasn't good enough for me because I'm a perfectionist. Working as a machinist in the tool and die industry for nearly 30 years, Kevin started creating his own machines to work on instruments. What started as side work out of his house became a full-time gig as the tool and die industry was downsizing. Seeing a need for a quality luthier in Charlotte, Kevin opened up Smiling Moon about five years ago. Precision and attention to detail are always tops on his list. So this is a, a manual milling machine that I built uh, specifically for guitar work. It does everything I want it to do. I use this thing every day. I could not operate my shop without it. And I machine all my parts when I make, like right here, I'm making a saddle for an acoustic guitar. So I machine it to size to fit the slide and the bridge. Uh, and even the, the string spacing, I have an engraving tool that I'll use and I'll put the string spacing exactly where it needs to be. So I try to I approach things a little differently because of my machining background. I try to be a little more precise with what I do. Active in the local music scene as a singer-songwriter since the early 90s, Kevin relies on word of mouth and his Facebook page and website to keep his business rolling. One of his bandmates in Kevin Marshall and the Jaywalkers is fellow musician Eric Lavelle. In general, he's, Kevin's a great luthier, but one of his, to me, his strong suits is the fact that he takes vintage gear and makes them modern, makes them very playable. I have a 1930-something parlor guitar that Gigi and I had bought for each other for our anniversary, and it was not playable at all, but now it's, it's a gem. We write lots of songs on it. I mean, it's got magic in it, but it's all because of Kevin's handiwork. somebody like Kevin as skilled as he is it's it's immeasurable really it's a dream come true <laughs> I've been I've been aspiring to do this all my life you know and, uh, Charlotte's a great city the music scene's really happening here and uh, so it's uh, it's been a good transition for me for Carolina Impact I'm Jason Terzis Thanks so much, Jason. You'll find Smiling Moon Guitars in the Arnold Palmer Center on Latrobe Drive in Charlotte. And we've got a link to its website along with this story on our Carolina Impact page at pbscharlotte.org. Well, if you've got a suggestion for a story you'd like to see featured on Carolina Impact, well, please, we'd love to hear from you. Send those suggestions to carolinaimpact at wtvi.org. And be sure to friend us on Facebook for a chance to win prizes in our monthly giveaway. Ty Kane from Charlotte won a family four-pack to the Carolina Renaissance Festival. Please tell your friends to like our page. We're giving more 
Renaissance Festival tickets away later this month. Well, from everyone here at WTVI PBS Charlotte, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and hope to see you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by the Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. A production of WTVI PBS Charlotte.